Hey guys, and welcome to the Movement Docs Podcast. I'm Jake. And I'm Mike. And we're just two guys who want to help students and clinicians grow in the field of rehab. Welcome to the show. Hey guys, and welcome to season two, episode three of the Movement Docs podcast. Today we've got a very special guest that we're really excited to have on and talk to. Uh, she was uh, in our cohort for the athletic training program, so we're really excited to get a chance to talk to her. There's a little heart emoji. <laughs> do that too. Yeah, for those that are watching along, there it is, another one too. So we'll uh, we'll give you a little bit of a bio here, and then we'll kind of run from there. So uh, Ashley Schuster is beginning her second year as the associate athletic trainer at McLean High School. Ashley completed her graduate work at Shenandoah University, where she received her Master of Science degree in athletic training. Whoop whoop. <laughs> well, <laughs> while at Shenandoah, Ashley was given the opportunity to work in the Fairfax County School System for a year, completing uh, semester rotations at Fairfax High School and Oakton High School, followed by spending a year at University of Mary Wash. At UMW, she worked primarily with all the fall sports and with men's lacrosse team in the spring. Ashley completed her bachelor's of science in exercise science with a minor in psychology from Salisbury University. Uh, Ashley's received her ITAT, which is a lot, sounds a lot like ATAT or the ADAT from Star Wars. <laughs> which is the, those are uh, for the those people that are listening and aren't familiar with Star Wars. It's the big ones that look like cows. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, it's amazing. <laughs> um, but uh, ITAT stands for Impact Trained Athletic Trainer Certification. She's a certified in CPR. <laughs> and firstly, bless you. <laughs> bless you. Uh, <laughs> bless uh, you the third time. I'm so sorry, Jake. Uh, <laughs> uh, she's a first aid instructor through e at ECSI and Grasson M1 certified. Ashley loves every part about working in the secondary school setting and being a part of so many athletic lives or athletes' lives. Uh, Ashley, welcome to the show. Thank you for coming on. We're Thanks for having me. I don't know what's happening. I'm allergic to the happiness. <laughs> oh. oh, It's the NATA. They're trying to get me to pay dues. <laughs> You're allergic to dues. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> All I wanted to do was become one of Tom Brady's certified body coaches. <laughs> and now they're punishing me because the job application area is a members-only content thing. <laughs> oh, the struggle is real. <laughs> I mean, how else am I going to know what the difference between flexibility, mobility, and pliability is? Mm. got to be a TV12 instructor, man. <laughs> True. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. So just just because this is kind of like absolutely ludicrous, on his website it says flexibility. How far can you bend? Mobility, how well can you move? <laughs> Pliability, how long before you break? <laughs> oh, I don't think I want to know what I don't want to know what that is. The I don't think quickly. that those words What's the, the Princess Bride quote? I don't think you know what that word means. <laughs> you keep saying that word. I don't think it means what you think it means. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, yes. Shout out to Tom Brady and Ugg Boots um, <laughs> for sponsoring today's podcast. <laughs> That'd be pretty sweet. That would be pretty cool. <laughs> You know, at like 2 a.m. last night, I was actually watching a random, like, just popped up YouTube video about, like, where does Tom Brady spend his money? And they were sent it saying that he, <clears throat> I don't know if it's every year, but one year he bought five pairs of Ugg boots for every player on the team. Oh, my gosh. Why do you need five pairs of Ugg boots? <laughs> because you can never have enough. I guess so. I mean, if you're willing to throw away money, you can just pass it my way. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> hey, we got loans. I mean, <laughs> right. you know. <laughs> yeah. TB, if you're listening to this, maybe you can help us out. <laughs> what are the odds that Tom Brady listens to our podcast? I'd say zero. Well, nothing's impossible. <laughs> maybe like point oh 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 one. Maybe we can just flood his Twitter and Instagram and Facebook with the link. We just start <laughs> have putting a hashtag TB12 and everything that we put out. <laughs> He's bound to look that way and see what yeah. it's all about. Be like, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, Lord. 
well, that's phenomenal. <laughs> well, we've uh, <laughs> we talked a little bit about your background and then uh, kind of derailed as is normal on this podcast. <laughs> but uh, Ashley, could you tell us a little bit more about yourself and uh, kind of what you're about and all that? Yeah, so I um, I kind of grew up a little bit of everywhere. I moved around a lot as a kid. Um, ended up kind of settling in upstate New York and Ithaca for kind of my growing up years. Um, and that's kind of where I call home. So Ithaca, New York is my home. Um, I went to college, played volleyball in college um, until I got hurt. And then that's kind of how I got into athletic training. Um, I've coached volleyball. I picked up an adult league, um, which I've come to realize that I'm much more out of shape than I ever thought that I was. Um, and it's really hard. Women are very competitive people. Um, and I've picked up indoor biking as well as outdoor biking. And anybody who outdoor bikes knows that when you have clips on a bike, it's something that takes a while to learn about. And I fell multiple times. <laughs> and uh, it's, you know, it's like learning how to ride a bike all over again, but with clips. Um, wait, wait, wait. So you're saying that learning how to ride a bike is like riding a bike? Yes. But like having to learn a whole nother level of it. So like so I haven't ridden like, a bike in a while. And then I've added in a whole nother component of like, let's clip in and clip out on a hill or at a stop sign or when there's cars coming. <sighs> so do you, do you think that it would be advantageous to have those like clip in shoes for like other facets of life? I mean, you get I feel like you work. It's It's yes, but I don't know what I would like them for. I don't know, like. I'm about to do the dishes. Let me just clip into the top floor. <laughs> so that in the in the event that water sprays on my feet, I don't I don't like eat it and crack my head open on the on the tile. It does. From my understanding, using clips on a bike is actually you get you have more power behind it because you're not like you're clipped in. So I was like, maybe if you clip into other things, you can generate more power. I don't know. Mm. Maybe like, if you lift with them, <laughs> clip your feet into. Or the if ground. I could clip into the deadlift platform. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, that'd be sweet. <laughs> Maybe we should uh, uh, design this. <laughs> yeah. Wait, wait. I kind of want a combination of like the bike clip in shoes and then the futuristic Nikes from Back to the Future that just like cinch into your foot. Because they actually made those. Like they they have them now. That would be, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, they the Bluetooth connect to your phone too. So you can adjust the like tension on them, I think. That's Technology. <laughs> Still waiting on that hoverboard, though. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, let's see. Other than biking, <laughs> um, I'm big into snowboarding. Um, I've recently gone out west a lot, and that's where I would love to move to. Um, I've been to Colorado and Montana this year. Um, I also have grandmother tendencies. Um, I like to knit. Um, <laughs> And that's kind of about it. I, I I'm not as a, I'm not, I don't think I'm a very exciting person, but I do what makes me happy <laughs> when I have time. Do you have an Do you have an Etsy page for your knitting? I don't because I don't knit fast enough. Mm. I need to like I need to just get better at knitting quicker. But that well, would be you just jack the prices up because the supply is low, but the demand <laughs> is high. That's that's true. Maybe I should I should look into that. For the I price like... of one <laughs> graduate school loan. <laughs> You can have this nice square <laughs> of knit that I knitted. You can use it as a pot holder. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I only know one stitch and I know how to make a scarf. So my next goal is to learn another stitch and learn how to make a hat. But I've said that for like three years now and clearly it hasn't gotten accomplished. So. Is that like a straight a straight a straight rectangle stitch versus like a circular stitch? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> I feel like if you learn those two things, you could probably make most anything that you think that you put your mind to. Yeah. I like, I've tried to follow patterns, but I just get too frustrated with them and I just give up. So. Cause like, if you were going to make socks, wouldn't it just be like a knit hat and then a series of scarves attached but, to it? Yes. Hmm. But you have to like worry about like the weird, like art shape. I don't know. Like, well, the heel. you don't have to. <laughs> you could just make it like a flat, like a straight sock. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I mean, you can make whatever you want. People will buy it. That's true. People will always buy things. <laughs> I saw I saw this thing. Um, just You just reminded me of that. It was the first thing sold on eBay. Oh, God. When the, when the website was created. And don't quote me on this, but I think this is what it was. And somebody put up I'm, a... I'm going to quote you on this. Okay, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> they put up a broken laser pointer. 
And that was like one of the first things or the first thing that was sold. And the guy like contacted the guy that bought the broken laser pointer. He's like, you realize that this is broken, right? I put this on the internet. He's like, yeah, I'm actually a collector of broken laser pointers. This is great. <laughs> It's like, interesting what? i guess everyone has their niche <laughs> yeah, what, what you do with broken laser pointers i don't know but yeah me either um, dude there's probably entire conventions of people like swap meets for broken <laughs> laser pointers i need i think we need to investigate this a little further <laughs> if there's one nearby we should go <laughs> oh man <laughs> do you think i'd get uh evp credits for that Looking yeah. up where laser pointer conferences are. Or going no, I mean, if I went to a laser pointer conference, would that be like EVP credit? <laughs> I mean, it has the word laser in it, right? And some <laughs> people use laser as modality, so it does. even mean, though I would never use laser as a modality, it counts, right? Uh, I don't think so. It's a good <laughs> question. You should bring it up to the the BOC. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> when you go to when you go to pay your dues, maybe you can yeah. write them a letter too. <laughs> Your your list of things you need to do is getting longer. Dear BOC, I'm sorry. Please reinstate me and take away the allergens that you have released. <laughs> <out. laughs> oh, good lord. <laughs> okay, so we've heard we've heard a little bit about your background and kind of where you hail from. Uh, you mentioned Ithaca, which yeah. is near dear to my heart as well, um, and some of our listeners, I'm sure, as well. So, uh, what was your favorite thing about Ithaca? Like, what's you called it home? So, like, uh, when you go back there, what do you look forward to most? So, I like all of my really good friends still live there, um, and I definitely took took for granted Ithaca when I lived there. Um, and looking back, I I shouldn't have left. I should have gone to the college, but I didn't, um, and it's fine though now. But um, I just love like we live we live right near the water and you have the gorges and you can go hiking and there's just something about that town that's just so it's just different and it's lovely and it's not like not like Northern Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> that's I like that's I like not having to plan my day around um, rush hour. Mm. So, um, yeah, I think it's pretty great. Mm -hmm. Especially in the winter time, and I love the snow. So, and <laughs> I loved all the snow there. <laughs> Speaking of snow, um, you were just recently out. You said you were just out west. Um, yeah. Maybe getting a little ahead of ourselves here, but you went to a conference out there, right? I did. Which okay, which big one? Big Sky. It? Okay. Um, so it's the Big Sky Sports Medicine and Athletic Training Conference uh, at Big Sky, Montana, and it is uh, Big Sky is a mountain resort in the Rockies in Montana. And the conference uh, was five days. And the way, so anyone who loves the outdoors and skiing and snowboarding, especially in February, needs to go. Um, it's a very intimate um, conference. There were maybe 250 participants. And um, Mickey Collins was there speaking. Dr. Visa oh, wow. was there speaking. And um, it's just a very laid back and um, <laughs> kind of like, close knit group and and you have these conversations with them and they're they're willing to talk to you and they schedule the day really nicely so you have your morning session from like 7 to 10 10 30 the slopes open at 9 so you only miss about an hour and then you have all afternoon off until 4 when the slopes close hmm. so they really set it up so that you get your session in the morning you can spend the day on the mountain and then come back for your afternoon session nice. um, and there was a concussion day there was an ortho day there was different events from different vendors and there was a Super Bowl watching party. And I, I learned so much from them and it was just, it was one of my favorite conferences to go to. Um, plus being in big sky was just amazing. So <laughs> um, definitely, it's definitely a conference that I don't think many people on the East coast know about because it is so small. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, if you're interested in, in that kind of stuff in a conference kind of out West and a close knit kind of, um, intimate conference compared to the bigger conferences. It's really something to check out and really cool. And I've definitely learned learned a lot. Plus, you get a lot of EVPs. So, so nice. <laughs> <Ayo>. <laughs> it, oh, it was so great. One of my favorite conferences. It will be my yearly conference. I think that I go to. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. Um, we'll make sure we put the uh, the link in the description in the show yes. notes for anybody oh, that's interested. So great. So great. <laughs> cool. Okay. Um, <laughs> 
Okay, so we talked a little bit about your background. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about um, why you chose athletic training and, and that kind of like background there? Yeah, so um, I played volleyball at my first college. Um, I was recruited to play at a small Division three school um, in the Berkshires in Massachusetts. And Hey, the Berkshires. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's about an hour, um, I think, east of Albany, I think it was. Um, so it was, I mean, a very small liberal arts college with about 120 people at it. Uh, so it was really small and I played volleyball. Um, I got hurt my first year, I ended up tearing my labor in my shoulder. Um, didn't really know that until, um, I kind of fought through it my freshman year and then kind of in our off season, I was like, Oh, this is kind of frustrating and I don't know what's going on. And I couldn't lift my arm above my head and I was like, well, it'll get better. I'll be fine. And then sophomore year rolls around and um, to a day start and things just get a lot worse. And I ended up in my athletic training room at college and called my dad and I was like, how do you change your major? Hmm. He's like, what? Um, cause I went in as an elementary education major thinking, I don't know, that's what everyone does. So, so why not? Um, and so I ended up changing my major to athletic training. Uh, and then kind of the program at my old first school wasn't accredited yet. It was in the process of being accredited. Um, and due to not really knowing when that would happen or if it would happen, um, I ended up transferring to Salisbury university, um, getting my, um, exercise science degree, just because I knew with the way that the, the athletic training program was shifting into getting a master's, um, that that was going to be the easiest route for me to get my bachelor's and then move on. Um, so kind of, I got hurt, spent every day in the athletic training room and it was like, Ooh, this is kind of fun. <laughs> the first thing my mom said to me was, you don't even like feet. What are you going to do? <laughs> oh, you want to get over it, I guess. Um, and here we are. So, um, it's, it was something that I think the, just how every day was different, even though I was the same person going in every day, the things that I did were different. The injuries that came in with me were different. Um, and I was like, wow, this is kind of fun. And, and I've always been fascinated with the human body and I've never been good at science. And so I was a little bit nervous to see kind of how that would go and knowing that this is such a like anatomy heavy profession, um, but kind of getting into the flow of things. It's definitely been, oh, it was, it's, that's how I got here. And it's, I'm definitely <laughs> glad I made the change. And as much as I'm bummed that I got hurt and couldn't play anymore in college, it was worth it. What is your worst foot story? <laughs> oh so we had a kid I don't know what was going on but he uh, I don't even remember how long ago it was but he was it was in grad school and he was a lacrosse athlete and he, we were taping his ankle or something and I he took his sock off and there was like sock fuzz and like it looked like a dermatitis issue but like his feet had like these little like weird holes that like I, you look it up and you're like oh this is weird like it's like a moisture issue and oh I was mm. like okay we're just gonna just do it suck it up and just go um <laughs> but we have like kids that don't cut their toenails and uh sweaty kids that come in that you're like oh when's the last time you like wash you do you take showers normally <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> but you know <laughs> mm -hmm. you just uh wash your hands a lot after <laughs> yeah. yeah i definitely feel like it's not the high school athletic trainer's job to instruct your child about personal hygiene <laughs> no <laughs> but sometimes i feel like ooh, you should probably cut your toenails or ooh, you should probably wash this <laughs> <laughs> i have been That's called true. a mother before so you know <laughs> when i was at james wood after at the end of one game this kid, this kid had like he was complaining like his toenail was was like bothering him or his toe was bothering him. So I go in the, the check in the locker room, and literally like his toe is like sitting here right, and his toenail is like at a ninety degree angle. <laughs> oh my gosh! How did that even happen? I took a picture of it because I had to show Jess, and I was like, "I just cut it off. Like, what do you want me to do?" <laughs> so just like yeah. did a little snip snip and then uh kind of like packed it and, yeah yeah but the it was like come in with like the sublingual hematomas and ingrown toenails you're like this wouldn't happen if like you cut your toenails or like when they cut them they cut them like so like so short and you're like oh don't cut them that short <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah 
good times. Good times with feet. <laughs> I feel like I feel like that's those are some situations where you're just like, do you have Google? <laughs> Can I help you out here? <laughs> because this is not proper hygiene, and let's talk about this. Go ahead and pull out your smartphone. I want you to open up a new Safari tab for me. <laughs> <laughs> let's Google foot hygiene. <laughs> Gosh. <laughs> Step one, take a shower. <laughs> oh, yeah. The worst is always after like those wet, wet games and their socks are just, and cleats are just wet and cold. And you're like, oh, I don't really want to talk to this or touch this or do anything with this right now. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, you know what this reminds me of? <laughs> Did anyone ever play Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2? I feel like my one. brother might have. <laughs> There's a song in there that's like more or less about personal hygiene <laughs> called If You Must by Del the Funky Homo Sapien. <laughs> All right. Have you ever listened to this? No. I don't think I have heard it either. I'm putting it in the show notes, though, so anybody that's <laughs> curious can, uh, can listen to it. So. Um, it should be Del the Funky Homo Sapien. It's okay. called If You Must. Are you looking it up? Yep. <laughs> Um, the suspense I know so here's the hook I'm gonna I'm gonna read this to you and this is gonna get a little bit PG for our listeners <laughs> <clears throat> but like this is just a classic song it was in Tony R. Pro Skater but the hook is you got to wash your ass if you must. You got to wash your hair if you must. You got to brush your teeth if you must, or else you'll be funky. <laughs> <laughs> That's a real song, huh? <laughs> uh-huh. That's amazing. <laughs> but, you know, nowadays kids aren't exposed to songs like this. And oh. I don't know that, you know. Are, are the musical artists of today really exposing our children to good. Uh, wholesome ideas uh, not Del, really, no Dell was just trying to tell people that you should put on some deodorant every once in a while <laughs> not be gross I think that's whenever we have conversations like with our sports teams during before the season starts we go into like all these big things and my biggest take home point is just don't be gross don't <laughs> wash your clothes wash yourself don't share water bottles and just Let's think about things. And they just look at me and I'm like, no, like I'm saying this for a reason. It's because you all need to not be gross. (laughs) This is a problem. (laughs) Go fix it. (laughs) Oh my gosh. (laughs) So other than feet, what are the things that you like about athletic training? And if someone was to, like, if you had a perspective, I don't know, like high school or undergrad student that's trying to figure out what they want to do with their life. What's your elevator speech for, for the profession of athletic training? So basically my thing is, is growing up being an athlete and a lot of the kids that are like ETSAs or, or are interested in the profession are athletes. And the, my biggest thing was, I don't think I could ever work a nine to five job in a cubicle all day long. This job, while yes, there is some administrative stuff to do, I get to go out to practice every day. I get to cover games every day and I get to, I get to be in a setting that is not boring to me. And that is always changing. And, and you can have eight different ankle sprains walk in the door and they all present differently. And so you have to think of different ways to do things. And so you kind of get to use, first of all, I think taping and bracing is kind of like arts and crafts on a daily basis. So you get to kind of play with things and create new ways of doing things. And there are, there's been a lot of times that I've tried a tape job or tried a, a splinting or something like that, that I wasn't taught, but thinking through things and, and you just kind of put it together and that's, it just works. And the biggest thing is, is if, if you love, if you love athletics, if you love being around sports and you, you find injuries and, and things like this fascinating, it's definitely something to look into. You don't get into it for the money. You don't get into it to be famous or whatever. Um, you're definitely kind of the hero behind closed doors. and, And sometimes you don't get that recognition that you think that you deserve, but when you do get it, it's, 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 it's great. And it just kind of reiterates the importance of what you do and why you do it. Um, so you do it because you love it. And I mean, I'm never bored. I tell the kids all the time, like you, (laughs) you all make my life so entertaining and fun and (laughs) it's something new every day. So that's kind of my big thing. And if if you have any interest in it at all, give it a try, go talk to your athletic trainer at your school and, and see if, 
if, if you can shadow them or see if that's even something that you're interested in doing. And just because you might not have been exposed to it in high school, I didn't have an athletic trainer in high school. I had no idea what they were. And when I got to college and, and saw that, I was like, wow, this is kind of cool. Even if you're older and, and, you, and you're not really liking your classes that you're doing, or you're not really happy in your job, there's really no wrong time to go back to school. If this is what you like, do it. It's so fun. So fun. It's, it's not work to me. So. so what kinds of things do athletic trainers do? Like, is it all oh. just ankle tapes and ice bags? <laughs> Because I feel like that's yeah. <laughs> I feel like that's no. the stigma that everybody has is oh they just put ice on you and, and tape your ankle. It definitely is, and it, and it's so much more than that. We have we treat injuries. We are trained in emergency care. So if somebody goes down and breaks their neck, we're the first ones there and can help them. And we know how to perform CPR. Um, basically, we're first responders on the scene. We can do prehab. We can do post surgery rehab. Um, we can diagnose and treat injuries and it's kind of a, it's a well-rounded um, approach to everything and, and kind of where your one-stop shop that um, we, we can do a lot. And it, it definitely is more than taping ankles and wrapping ice bags, but we, we do do that as well. But um, it's more about trying to potentially prevent injuries and work on um, instabilities or um, differences between sides and, and working on just general strength and mobility and flexibility and Oh, it's just the list goes on. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I, I love it because it's it's almost like a like a continuum of care, right? You're you're there when the, when the athlete goes down on the field and they're injured, right? You're there to help kind of coach them through that that kind of traumatic and kind of scary, um, you know, incident. Uh, you act as part athletic trainer, part therapist. It's it, it, you it, you play a lot of roles, and it's oh, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> which is just cool. And then you have the performance side of things too. Like you're, mm-hmm. you know, even when they get back from, you know, their injury and they're feeling better, there's still things that they can work on and you can get them stronger and faster and, and that kind of thing too. So. Well, and the other cool thing is, is that even if you don't necessarily love sports, you can work with the military, you can work with the, with law enforcement, you can work with performing arts, you can work with. Uh, hey. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you, there's so many different avenues that maybe, maybe sports aren't your thing and maybe you want to, Maybe you want to work in a clinic and assist in surgery. Maybe you want to work with performing arts. You could just hey. <laughs> you could just do so much. Mm-hmm. That's phenomenal. Uh, I don't so think you, I would like performing like, arts, but you mentioned like a, oh well, that's that's for a different time. <laughs> um, <laughs> you mentioned surgery though. What I are ATs, and I mean obviously I'm playing the devil's advocate here, but can ATs like work someplace that's outside of a a school and sports area like what's what's up with that they can so um clinical athletic training residencies are kind of up and coming and new um newer um and being an athletic training resident working in a physician setting you can kind of act as that right hand man for a physician um helping see patients helping um potentially helping in surgery helping kind of do clinical evaluations and clinical diagnosis and kind of see the path you want to take using obviously best practices and and you can kind of work in you see the you see the athletes or the people after the injury occurs which is kind of cool but you can you can kind of follow them kind of whole circle so you see them before the injury and then they have surgery and then you can see them after surgery and then kind of just everything comes again comes full circle and being able to see them in a different kind of atmosphere out, outside of the school setting or outside of the military setting mm. <clears throat> I love that I also, I think, um, you know, something that you kind of mentioned too, is like, you never have a, uh, it's different every day. Right. And mm-hmm. so, you know, I, I kind of think, uh, you get that variety aspect of, of this career, which is awesome. And then it's also just like you're solving puzzles all day. Right. <sighs> yeah. You know, so you can be very creative in the way that you kind of, um, kind of approach different situations and you can approach it many different ways. Like you mm-hmm. said, there's eight different ankle injuries and they all present differently. So how do you best help that athlete? And yep. You can kind of, mm-hmm. yeah. And it's, it's fun to kind of, try to weed out um like okay well let's throw this at you today and if it doesn't work then let's try something else or let's if this didn't work today let's go back to what we did before that you saw some relief but let's change something a little bit like it's a lot of trying to mix and match different things that you have learned and try to put the best kind of program together for somebody that again might work for somebody but not might not work for somebody else Mm -hmm. It's definitely, it's definitely a challenging, it's challenging every day, which is really fun. And it really makes you think and really 
kind of dig deep and wonder why is this going on is there something that I'm missing and it's it's like solving puzzles every day which is super fun <laughs> <laughs> that's great and, how, you know it's oh go ahead Dick. oh no the mic finish no, no 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 you're good I was gonna say how do you combat the mad rush of people like right after that school bell yeah. so unfortunately well not unfortunately I guess the, our fall season speaking just from a secondary school setting because that's what I'm, I know um, the fall season is always busiest for us um, dealing because we have football, which obviously is, has a lot of kids. And then you have all the other fall sports, volleyball, field hockey, cross country. Um, and you have the coaches that are like, okay, we're starting practice at three 30. Okay. Well, the bell rings at two fifty five, And when you have 50 kids in the, in the athletic training room, it, it, it's definitely challenging, but we have kind of created a little kind of schematic of how we do things. Obviously if it's a new injury, they are seen last because it takes the longest time. Um, if they've been coming in and just need um, <clears throat> to do rehab or if they just need like turf and covered, they're kind of higher because it's quick and easy and gets out the way. If the kid has come in before and knows kind of their rehab exercises and what they need to do, just check in and get started and then make sure before they leave that they don't have anything else to do. Um, I can't, I don't think there's ever been a time that we've been on practice, been to practice on time. <laughs> um, and you kind of just have that conversation with, um, the coaches and just say, Hey, look, like you gave us 35 minutes after school and we are seeing 50 kids between two people. And still that's a lot. And we still have to get waters ready. So basically it's just, it's prioritizing, um, and, and reiterating that, if it's a new injury, they're not going to be seen until later on. And sometimes they're okay with that. Sometimes they're not, they're not. Um, and just, I mean, we write a lot of notes to coaches <laughs> that are like, we saw so-and-so at this time. Um, so sometimes they don't understand how busy it is. And then they come in and they're like, oh, okay, get it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's just trying to, again, prioritize really and do the best you can at that point. Yeah. You kind of have to like, uh, triage almost it's yeah. like you have 50 people running and you're like okay so who do i see, need to see right yeah. now and, or and like if fun. three kids have the same injury and they all have they're kind of grouped together you can kind of even have them help each other with their own rehab like if it's holding a band for four-way ankle exercises or um if they're doing single leg balance with a ball toss you, you can have one balance one ball toss and switch and so it's trying to just use use what's available to you and the best possible way to get kids in and out <laughs> <laughs> I actually really like the – it's it's such an interesting, like, component of rehab because there's some days where you have, like, one or two people in there yeah. and, like, nothing's going on. And then there's days where it's just, like – Chaotic. It's, yeah. It's <laughs> and you have, like, eight new injuries that walk in the door and you're like, whoa, can't we spread this out a little bit? <laughs> but there's just, like – it's there's something fun, though, like, with that because yep. sometimes you kind of get into, like, a flow state and you're just like, I got this. Yep. And you're like, you, this, you, that, you, that. You, and you're just like spinning around in a whirlwind, just like orchestrating. It's like, uh, like what is it, Mickey in uh, Fantasia? Oh, just yeah. like yeah. commanding all the mops and stuff, except, you know, these are, yeah. these are people with feelings. And, yes. And... <laughs> oh, yes. It is. It, there are times that like it's super stressful because everyone walks in the door. Um, but there are other times that, um, I mean, it's fun. It's. I like that the kids are comfortable to come in and they want to come in. Um, but sometimes I'm like, all right, if you're done, get out. <laughs> you don't need to be in here. Um, but it is, it is a fun time. Um, winter and fall or winter and spring season for us are relatively a little bit, are they calmer? Um, just because we kind of stagger practices a little bit more and we don't have to go outside anymore. Um, because football is a collision sport. They can't be without us ever. Um, but everything else kind of can function without us and we're kind of on call so um during the fall and the spring um it's kind of I get to utilize more of my manual my manual therapies and feel like I can spend more time doing long-term rehabs and kind of take a little bit longer on evaluations because there's more time to do things and there's not as many people that you're trying to kind of juggle so I like the fall or the winter and the spring because I have more time but the fast-paced kind of work environment during the fall is something that I miss when we're a little slower <laughs> <laughs> that's fair yeah so definitely kind of ebbs and flows depending on uh what yeah. sports and season and all that yeah that's actually one thing that uh at where i work brad and i have started to we roll our we kind of run our afternoons basically just like a training room 
I mean, it, it works like and it's PT fine. patients. Yeah. It's like, cause we get, a, we do a lot of rehabs for like local, um, like athletes and stuff that are like mm -hmm. off season. And so it's just, you need after school times. All right. We're going to have a lot of people between three and seven. Let's do it. Yeah. And just roll. That's kind of a cool idea, especially in, I mean, in your clinic, you have a lot of, you have a lot of space to do a lot of things and, and that's a good idea. I like that. It's, it makes sense. It's fun. I mean, there's there's times where there's like two or three do, groups doing like performance training with like, we're talking like groups of like 15, 20 people like on the field. There's, you know, Brad and I will each have probably like three to four patients staggered at like different arrival times. Um, and then there's people like in there training for whatever in small groups. It's it, that, that gym can get kind of packed, but <laughs> it's it's fun. There's moments where like brad john and i'll kind of like look around and be like what happened over the past hour <laughs> <laughs> uh, but like, i think like that the there's the storm where you just yeah compress. <laughs> you like you like look across and there's just like there's like bands and kettlebells just like strewn across the floor there's like just so much crap left out and we're just like what <laughs> what happened <laughs> oh <Backed> yeah out. <laughs> But I mean, that's, that's just, I, I love that kind of like, I mean, there's times where it's frustrating, but I really like that fast pace. Like you have to think on your feet and, you know, yeah. just figure it out. Yeah. And use, I mean, use what you have, which is sometimes the secondary school, we don't have as much as you guys do. Um, but it's definitely, it's definitely fun. The fast paced work environment. I, the slow times I'm like, oh, this is so boring. Like I go out to practices. I just, I walk around cause I just, I can't sit there. Um, but during the fall season, I'm like, oh, huh. like when I actually get to sit down at practice, I'm like, oh, let's, let's take a second and decompress. <laughs> <laughs> That's phenomenal. I love that. Well, uh, you know, we would uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't uh, kind of talk about this and mention this a little bit. Um, you know, so all of us had the awesome privilege of graduating from uh, Shenandoah University. Oh, the uh, awesome and Oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> with all the trials and tribulations associated with it. But yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I want to talk a little bit about that and kind of your experience and um, your perspectives from that. And so, um, you know, for those of uh, anybody that's listening out there um, that might be interested in uh, kind of applying to Shenandoah University and all that kind of stuff, why um, why did you choose Shenandoah in particular? And what did it mean to you? What did you learn? That kind of stuff. So I actually, so my family moved to Virginia um, about five years ago. Um, and so my kind of goal, so I graduated from my bachelor's in 2013. Um, I moved to Virginia in 2014 and was like, well, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to take a couple of years, I don't know, work as a personal trainer because I had just gotten my CPT and um, we'll work on doing some prereqs for grad school. And I had thought that I wanted to go to like a Seton Hall or an LIU or some, some big school because I didn't have that experience in undergrad. Um, and so actually one of my neighbors she coordinates with this um, youth football league. And um, she was like, oh, we hired an athletic trainer to kind of work these, these youth league. Why don't you go and just talk to her? Cause she went to Shenandoah. Hmm. And I was like, all right. Like I hadn't heard of, I had heard of it from a, a family friend of ours and he had nothing but great things to say about the program. Um, but I was like, it's an hour away. It's in Winchester, Virginia. <laughs> I was like, this is not really where I want to go. Um, but all right, like I'll go talk to her and we'll just see what it's about. Um, I mean, I knew on the reputation of the program, but again, I was like, I want to go to like this massive school. And um, so I went to go talk to her and she basically said, why don't you just apply and see what happens? And I said, well, I haven't taken um, my GRE. I still have all these corrects to do. And she goes, you can get a contingent or like, or, like a provisional acceptance if you get these things done. And I was like, all right. So I set up a, um, I emailed uh, Roche Meeg and asked her to kind of meet with her and talk with her about like what I had done and looking at what I still needed to do. And so um, I ended up just applying because uh, why not, I guess. And I, that's the only program I applied to this, like this early on, because I still didn't think that I was going back to school for another year. Um, I got in and I was like, well, uh, <laughs> guess I'm going to grad school. <laughs> <laughs> um, and actually with speaking with her and then starting the program um, I'm actually really happy that I chose it because the class sizes were so they're, they're a good size and you have a good variety but the professors know who you are and they know they know they know you and it's not just you're not just a name and um, 
it was, I think the fact that you could, you could do a rotation on division one school while I'm not actually going to the division one school is really awesome. Plus getting to work with like literally every level or every type of setting you could ever really want. Um, and while the program itself um, was a little intimidating and hearing kind of the, the horror stories behind it and how you take the passenger for summer and if you don't pass, you're done and you can reapply the year after. And I was like, oh God, okay. Um, and so that's kind of how I, I chose Shenandoah. It kind of chose me too, because that's <laughs> a draw, I guess. Um, but it was, I think, the best decision for me, especially being that it was it was close to home in a sense because I don't think that I was ready at that time to move somewhere else um and I think the opportunity that's there is is far better than kind of just working with the school that you're at and you the opportunity to literally go wherever you might want to go um is really cool so I'm happy I went sometimes (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> it's it's really interesting because when you look at like the clinical placements that like SU is such a small school it's such a small program but like you went to Mary Washington mm-hmm. uh, we had people go to University of Arizona Rutgers, University of Washington <laughs> you know, the Naval Academy Virginia Tech the Redskins <laughs> yeah I went to the Redskins yeah. and and now like we have these established connections like um, yeah. I think from this is kind of on the low low, but there's a couple more big time yeah. D one schools that are going to be yeah. added to where they're going. Yeah, um, and they're going to be amazing. sending like multiple people to uh, to some of these places. Yeah, and that I think there might be potentially uh, two spots with with the skins and stuff in the future. So that's, and like I mean, there was an overseas rotation at one point. I don't know if that's still going on, but I think just the opportunity again that's that's there and the connections like. John does a really good job and prides himself on making those connections. And he's not, he's, I mean, they, they expect a lot of us. And I think that's something that's really, that stands out about our program is that people know when they get a Shenandoah student, what to expect, to expect good things because we have, we're well prepared. And sometimes (laughs) as as awful as some of those weeks were um, during the summer, but it's it is really awesome and i think not every not every program has that opportunity which is really cool mm-hmm. plus yeah. they're like they're trying to do what they can to <clears throat> provide you with some like con ed stuff like during school so that you can come out with some more certifications or, or courses mm-hmm. that <clears throat> that you could use um, yeah especially. yes so. i think coming out especially with like with the grass and m1 um a lot of people that i've talked to about it um are really jealous because it's an expensive program and and it was something that was offered to us great we still had to pay for it <laughs> but it's being able to come out with that was really cool um and then kind of like the pam certificate is another option that we can do so i think the opportunity to really get anything that you could ever want is pretty cool oh yeah that's and that's and you, and you kind of hit the nail on the head too when you kind of talk about uh, the connections and the people and the professors actually know you. Um, it makes such a difference when you're surrounded by people that actually care about you and your success. You know, I don't know. It just it just seems like with some of the larger places sometimes it's uh, it, you can just be a number, but there it's like, no, how you doing? You know, how's your family? Yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I mean, I, there are times that I will still just like on my way to visit my grandfather or something. I'll just go stop by and see who's in their office. And I mean, I still email a bunch of our professors on a regular basis because of of life questions and can you read over my resume? Can you do this or? I'm really confused and I don't understand what's going on. Can you help me? And and it's they they're more than willing to help you and and they remember you and they they care. <laughs> and they want to see you succeed and they, it's just it's it's this close little knit family that I mean we graduated with 15 people and we're all still kind of I mean we're all in a group chat still together. So <laughs> 2 years later. Yep. <laughs> sending sending memes back and forth and yeah. Keeping oh, up yeah. with each other. So, that's good. That's oh, really good. Random so, per diem jobs. <laughs> that too. So speaking of uh, a year later, how has your like clinical practice changed since oh. you've come out of school? So I my first so I got hired at my high school um, in June. So we graduated in May. I got hired in June, 
Um, and then we started preseason kind of, and my job started the last week of July. And I mean, I felt pretty confident going out. Um, but the first time that I was left at practice by myself, I was like, oh my God, like I am now the sole person here. And now this is on me. And if somebody gets hurt, like there's no one else around. Um, and so I, um, I made a lot of phone calls to parents about everything. I sent emails to parents about everything because I just wanted to make sure that things were being relayed, even if it wasn't anything major or like if a kid got, was, was throwing up at practice because he was dehydrated, like still sending that email, just saying, Hey, I want you to be aware of this. And I was not as confident as I thought that I was. I, every, every single new change of season or new sport that I had to cover this anxiety in me built up because I was like, oh my God, let's let's just jump to worst case scenario as to what can happen. And I did that every time. And so my first year was was challenging and, and it got easier as I went and as things started to happen. Um, and then this year I am, I'm still not like, obviously I've gotten a lot better and, and I've been, been put in or things have been put in front of me that have really challenged me physically, mentally, and emotionally. But it has shown me that like one, I can do it. And two, like it's there, things happen for a reason and you learn from them and um, you learn what to do and what not to do. And I still call and I still email parents about little things, but I just would rather over communicate and then under communicate. But as I, I can now cover practice without getting anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good. <laughs> oh man. Kind of, kind of along the same vein there, um, kind of looking back at your experience over this past year, you know, if you could jump in a time machine and go back to meet yourself right when you were starting out, what kind of advice would you give yourself um, who's just starting out? Uh, it's okay to not know the answers to things. And it's okay to not feel comfortable. And, and you don't need to act like you're, you're comfortable in a situation because, I mean, fake it till you make it, yeah, but it's okay to not feel comfortable. I remember covering my first cross country meet and just like my, my hands were clammy. It was super hot. And I was like, Oh my God, please. Like, I don't even know what can happen, but please don't happen. <laughs> um, and, and it's okay. It's okay to fail. It is okay to fail. And, and if you don't, you're not learning and you're not, you're not growing as a clinician or as a professional. So um, and, and take time for yourself. Really. I tended to, I didn't take a day off of work until this year. And, um, I mean, it's, it's taken a toll, but I mean, I love, I love my kids and I don't, I don't want to leave them. <laughs> <laughs> um, so definitely, I think just taking time for yourself and, and learning that it's okay. It's okay to say, no, it's okay to not do everything that's thrown your way. And it's okay to ask for help. Mm -hmm. Even if you don't think that you need it, sometimes you do. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. I feel like that's such a hard thing too, is to kind of uh, be vulnerable in that aspect and say, Hey, I, I, I need some help with this or it's kind of a fine line that you have to kind of figure out, like be being independent. Yes. But also learning to know and what is too much for you or what is, can you push a little more or when you actually need help? Um, and, and knowing when to ask for help is a really important thing. And, and it's, don't be ashamed to ask for help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I couldn't agree more. That's awesome. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just taking a second to kind of take that in. So there's the there's the the chill aspect that I usually get in most of these shows. So thank you for that. Um, Mike, now you can use emojis to signify that. Oh wait, hold on. <laughs> yep, hold on. Let me let me do this. Yep, there that is. There needs to be like a shiver one. <laughs> um. So. Why does the thumb move? I don't know. It makes me think of uh, like rocket power when they put the thumbs together and they go. Is like that, is that woogity 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 woogity. <laughs> that's woogity woogity. Oh, yeah, thinking, oh, oh, it's Hey Arnold that does the. the <laughs> yeah, and then the the woogity woogity. So Skype, if you're listening to this, I don't know. <laughs> Add those in. <laughs> do you real question though? Do you think Tom Brady's made it this far in our our podcast? We haven't talked about him in a while, so you probably lost interest. Yeah. <laughs> if we okay, so if we do get like a like an influx of listens coming from Massachusetts, I might I might freak out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. It'd be interesting. 
but yeah okay um so we've talked about a lot of different stuff and kind of like your realizations and like kind of your your personal growth over this past year as a new grad um in the beginning we kind of talked a little bit about um, this impact certification mm-hmm. um you know and so for I, I don't know. I know a little bit about it, kind of like cursory information and how to use it. But, you know, so for any of our listeners out there who have kind of heard about it or want some more information, information about it, uh, what is impact and, and kind of like how do you use it? Um, so we use it. Um, we baseline all of our kids, um, freshmen and new kids or juniors in the program, um, basically to get a baseline of them. So if 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 in the event an injury or a concussion occurs that we can kind of see where they fall compared to their baseline. Um, so basically it has, um, a couple different components involved to it. So it consists of domains of, um, visual and memory, um, visual and verbal memory composite, visual motor speed, um, reaction time, impulse control, um, kind of a, a, a whole conglomerate of things. And, and in the little tasks throughout, there's delayed recall, there's, um, being able to just like reaction time and how quickly you can distinguish between letters and, um, shapes and if they're the same direction and things like that. Um, and so it kind of is a, it's a well encompassing kind of t- a tool that we use to look at various things and cog- cognit- cognitively woo, um, <laughs> to kind of look to see where there might be some impairments with, with this injury. Um, and obviously it's not just, it's not just the one tool that we use to, to help diagnose a concussion. Um, we use, we also use VOMS, the vestibular ocular motor screen, um, and then also symptoms. So it's, it's kind of a well-rounded, um, concussions are, are in depth and they're, they're challenging and they have a lot of things going on and it's not just going to be one thing that's going to help you, help you diagnose that. Um, some kids are really good test takers and their impact scores are great. And you're like, well, what the heck? And then you look at their VOMS and their symptoms and they're off the chart. And so that's why it's one, one part of that. And, and explaining to people that, Yes, this is something that we use, but even though it's showing, it might show that that their impact test is okay. But look at all these other things that are going on. Um, so it's it's definitely a, a tool in the toolbox to use um, when helping you diagnose a concussion. Um, I mean, there are other programs out there. Um, we use Impact. There's um, there's other platforms that have similar ideas behind kind of the same delayed recall, reaction time, things like that to get to you to help you get to the same kind of realization and goal of if this is a concussion or not, or to help you kind of establish that. Gotcha. Okay. I like, I like what you said is, is you kind of use it as, um, you know, like one piece of the puzzle in terms of looking at this thing. Cause I, I think you're right. I think concussions can be, um, you know, very multifaceted and, and look at a lot of different um, aspects. And so it's nice to get some objective data just to say, like, you know, where were you before you had this injury? Where are you now? Yeah. Um, does that match up? And then looking at all those other um, variables and factors, too, uh, which is pretty cool. Yeah, because the other the other the big thing with concussions is you look at symptoms. And that's obviously so subjective that. Is this really going on? Is it really that bad or or is there kind of an underlying problem? And so having those kind of objective measures to kind of help either um, kind of affirm or kind of, oh, okay, well, let's, let's dig a little deeper into why you might be feeling like this. Is, is there an underlying anxiety issue? Is there uh, like ADD or things like that that are causing these symptoms to be that high? Um, so having, having those objective measures definitely helps um, kind of pick apart what kids are thinking and things like that. So Which, if I'm not mistaken, like, isn't there, doesn't like ADD or ADHD kind of like um, call your impact results like into question a little bit? It does. And, and they definitely, they ask you the biggest thing, they ask you if you have a, lear- a learning disability in kind of the preliminary baseline test. And then um, they ask if you have ADD or ADHD. Um, the biggest thing is, is that even though you might have one of those things or learning disability or ADD or ADHD. um, That's why we, that's so important to have baselines because if you look at somebody with dyslexia or with ADD, their, their baseline is going to be different than somebody who doesn't have that problem, but they're looking at their baseline. That's their baseline. So how does their new test compare to their baseline? Um, And, and it's something that we take into consideration too. So, if it's a dyslexic person and, and there's a P and a Q. So obviously having a distinguish between a P and a Q is pretty challenging. Um, but if, if their baseline was pretty good, then and if they're still having issues post-injury, then yes, it's still an issue, but 
they can distinguish between the two. So it's, it's still looking at the individual person, even though they might have that, that disability. Um, it's not a, like, I wouldn't look at your baseline to look at my scores because it's, we're two different people, three different people. <clears throat> Makes sense. That might actually be um, good information too. Have you ever had to, um, let's say, you know, an athlete has a concussion, right? Um, and they've been dealing with this for a little bit and, you know, they're really anxious to get back into the game. Uh, their parents really want them to get back in, uh, you know, uh, and they keep saying like, oh, when can, when can my son or daughter get back in? Uh, you know, and like, have you ever had to deal with that experience? And like, uh, have you used impact in a way to kind of help um, say, no, they're not quite there yet? Or, or yeah. what has your experience been? Yeah. And it's, and fortunately we haven't had that a whole lot. Um, and, and it, I deal with, I, I've had more with, kids not being ready to go back even though there's impact scores and everything else to return to normal um but i i sit down with kids when they take their when they take base or their impact test and and kind of go through well like here's what here's what the score should have been and here's where you are so like the normal range is this but you can see how you're still lower or this is really good you got you got the normal or whatever they wanted you to get um and explain to them that that it it's okay that if this is still not back to normal because there's still something going on and 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 while you have that two to four week for a normal concussion are concussions really normal like <laughs> they're not really one like everybody is different and, and and responds to them differently and um the biggest thing that i always ask kids before i clear them is are you ready to get hit again or are you ready to take a stick to the face again? Or are you ready to head the ball again? And if the answer is no, I'm not going to clear you because you have to also be mentally ready to go back. Um, and it, there, I, I don't get a lot of pushback from parents, which is really great. I think that they've, they've, they understand that, that their child has one brain and it's while a concussion is like, it, it's like any other orthopedic injury also not because you can kind of push an ankle sprain a little bit harder than you would a concussion um and you have to be a little bit more careful with the progression because somebody can be doing really great and then all of a sudden have this crazy setback and you have no idea why um and and i'm not willing to risk someone's brain to go back into a high school game (laughs) Mm -hmm. and and once they kind of realize and they kind of come down from being mad or frustrated with me that they get it and it makes sense. And I, and I get it. The heat of the moment, you want to play in that game. I, I know, but I'm not willing to risk my, my license and for your health and, and your health is way more important to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I like, I love what you said. Um, that, that question that you asked, you know, you know, uh, can you take a hit? Can you, can you look me in the eye and tell me that you're ready to take a hit? Um, cause I, sometimes I feel like that's one of the most powerful tools in our toolbox is, is that question, the eye test. And, um, you know, with every other measure that we have, mm-hmm. even just asking that one question to see if the athlete truly believes they're ready to go back in yeah. is huge. I feel like that's, that, that kind of test is like super, super, uh, relevant in wrestling yes. because you have <laughs> such a short injury time thing. Yeah. And it's like, you literally got to go, can you wrestle? Are yeah. you going to finish this match? Yeah. Like, I mean, if you don't see a broken bone and they're able to stand and walk, put, put pressure on it, it's like, you know, do you want to finish this or are you done? Yeah. Wrestling I mean, if there's like a head injury, like obviously you're yeah. just like, nope, <laughs> yeah. you're out of here. Wrestling is its own beast in itself, but um, it's such a fun, I love working wrestling, but it is like you have to, can you do this? Yes or no. Um, if there's any sort of hesitation, you're done then don't do it. Don't. I'm not willing to risk it. You shouldn't be willing to risk it. It's not worth it. Um, and that's, it also helps knowing the kids. And, and there are, there are kids like when you build these relationships that, you know, like if they're the type of kid that can actually push through something that then they're not actually that bad or something is, is really wrong. And they, they might not pull themselves unless you do it for them. Um, but yeah, I've had a lot of, can you go? Yes or no. If not, nope. <laughs> we're gonna forfeit <laughs> yeah. no that's so true and you just mentioned something too kind of like knowing knowing your athletes i think that's one of the most beautiful things about uh being an athletic trainer is you do have those really good relationships so you know when something's not quite right mm-hmm. it's the relation that i think that's one of my favorite parts about the job is building those relationships and being that person that 
kids can come to and they might not tell a teacher, they might not tell a coach, but, but you have built that relationship that they want to come talk to you about things or they just want, like, they will tell you when something is wrong, when you, they might not tell somebody else. And um, that's one of my favorite parts about this profession is just having that relationship and knowing like walking through the halls or in meetings and somebody says your name and kids start cheering. Like it's, it's, it's such a good feeling and knowing that you have that positive influence on them. And, and especially at the high school, age, the high school level, this is a very, very important time in their lives. And they're learning to be people that they want to be and learning the type of person that they are and, and feeling like I have a little bit of an impact maybe on some kids and, and being that potentially that, that positive influence for them or being that person that's there to listen and, and just kind of give them good, bad, the ugly truth about what's going on. And it's, it's what it's again, one of my favorite parts about the the profession Mm -hmm. as much as they sometimes drive me up a wall. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Speaking about relationships, um, what about relationships in the, in the community? Cause like, obviously I mean, Mike, you're in a position where you're in both like, you know, PT clinic and an AT clinic. Right now, I'm just in a PT clinic, but I'm hoping to do like more athletic training services and stuff as the time goes on. But like how, what is the best way for like non-athletic trainers to communicate with athletic trainers? Because I feel like, I mean, obviously, potentially there's some like HIPAA involvement as far Mm -hmm. as communicating medical information back and forth. Um, but like, I feel like there are a lot of other clinicians that don't really understand the scope of athletic training practice Yeah. or like don't know how to best work with their athletic trainers. Like, yeah. what, and what, are, what are your thoughts on that? So that's definitely huge because I mean, even though athletic training isn't necessarily a new profession, it's, it's up and coming. And I think the popularity of it is growing. Um, we are... I have sent a couple kids to different PTs in the area and we have a, we have a really good communication and, and um, it's, it's mostly email um, kind of checking in and doing things like that. Um, the also the biggest thing that helps with kind of, kind of getting out who we are is during like our PPE nights, our physical nights. And we have PTs, Kairos, a bunch of people coming in to help do a physical exam on these kids. And so, you get to work with a bunch of different people, but, um, we have a physician. Yeah. He's a, I guess he's, Oh, he's a, I don't know. I think he's a Cairo. Um, but he actually has been, been treating a lot of our patient or our kids. And so he's actually reached out to us and wants to sit down and talk to us and meet with us and see how we can work together. So I think it's a kind of a combination of making sure that you put out a good name for yourself as an athletic trainer and at the school that you work in. And then if kids go out, to different different PTs, Kairos, um, things like that, and and saying, oh, my athletic trainer at school has done this, or um, having coaches that refer to different people or also work in the medical field, um, say, our athletic trainers at this school do this. Like you guys should talk and communicate and and kind of work together. And so um, we have a couple of coaches that are really good and that really really back us and and say nothing but good things about us. And so. Um, we have people that want to come and just talk to us and see how we can kind of collaborate and work together because it is about working together. It shouldn't be about one person trying to outdo another person. The main goal of, of, of us is to make sure that the kids are getting the best care that they can. And if that means sending them to somebody else or on the days that they're not seeing a PT outside of school, then, then doing their rehab with us. And I think it's, it's not a, it shouldn't be about who is better or who they're seeing. It's, it's how can we help them as a whole to get better. Um, so definitely trying to make sure we have a good name for ourselves and um, really just um, try to communicate with people that want to kind of come hang out and come talk to us and see what we do um, is super important and, and being open to that and not not feeling a, not getting offended when a kid says they're going to see somebody else. I don't care. That's fine. Like, ha- let me know how I can help you when you're ready. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> One of the things that that like we try to do is if it's someone that's in season we try to get in contact with the athletic trainer and say, like, is this someone that you you want to see, mm-hmm. right? Obviously, it's, obviously, it's like in-season football player, you should be with your athletic trainer. You don't need to be, be with right. them. But sometimes we get, like, you know, parents get referrals from an orthopedic doc or whatever, and it's like, 
you know, you need to go, go to see a physical therapist. And it's like, well, I also think it's about having a good relationship with your team doctor. If your team doctor yeah. is, is good with you doing rehab and refers you back to, to but your athletic trainer, I think that's great. And it's about explaining yeah. to your, your team doctor, what you can do and what, what your limitations are, but also what you, what you're able to do. And sometimes it's not always sending out to PT. I think that there's, there are definitely great times to send out to PT, but again, in season football players might not necessarily have the time to go to see somebody, but there yeah. are times to that. There are times that it should be used. Definitely. Um, and then sometimes you'll get like fall athletes that are in season, maybe like cross country mm-hmm. that because it's a football season and there's like a lot of stuff going on. Um, if they have a good relationship with their AT, their AT is like, yeah, go, go see whoever and just get yeah. this done and we'll kind of be in communication with you. Yeah. Um, one of the things we try to do too is like, if we have post-op patients that get surgery in the off season and then, you know, their goals return to sport, it's like, all right, well, this is spring sport start date. And, you know, if you're, you got the clearance from your doctor, you're just about ready to go physically. You don't really need PT anymore, but here's, you know, like we can communicate with your AT. Like this is, this is what we're still seeing. These are the continued deficits. Mm-hmm. You go. Yeah. And I definitely think, it, it has to be an open line of communication between all parties involved, really. Um, yeah, it's really, especially with post-ops and looking at protocols and, and when they're done with PT and coming back, like obviously there's protocols for a reason and what they need to follow certain things. And um, I just think, again, being open, being able to communicate with people and understand mm-hmm. that you, the main goal is to help people and to not, to not not help them i guess <laughs> yeah check the ego at the door realize yes. it's not about you <laughs> no it's, it's about the athlete and it's there are times that i was kind of bummed that kids were going outside of of us for rehab but at the same time like it was during it was during a crazy time and, and it might have been a cross-country kid and and i am not comfortable well i'm not super confident in my abilities for like run analysis stuff and looking at proper foot mechanics and things like that and so um, I know a PT who all she does is gait analysis and running mechanics. And so every cross country kid that came in the door, I referred because I want them to get the best care. And it's something that I'm not confident in. And if, 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 if you're not confident in it, I want to make sure that there is somebody that can help them. Um, and then obviously after they saw her and she pers- like emailed back and told me what was going on and gave me some ideas to work on like that, that helps. Um, but just also knowing when, when you don't know what to do, it's okay to refer. <laughs> yeah, I think that's part of, you know, uh, especially in healthcare, that kind of autonomous practice, right, is being able to treat what you can, and then also understanding like when to refer and like who to refer to. And, uh, and no when is well. long enough. If mm-hmm. you're not getting better within a certain time, don't keep trying things because obviously it's not working. And, and it's, it's okay to have another set of eyes on you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <couldn't> uh. <laughs> yeah <laughs> well that's good um we'll kind of rock and roll um we just got a couple, a couple well, we're getting we're getting close to, to the end of our show here so um i do have a couple of questions uh to ask and um you know uh there's just one thing i'm kind of interesting because i was reading some of these uh questions and one of them was uh you know like what kind of books are you reading right now <laughs> Yes. And so, yeah, yes. so um, those and like some of the books that you recommend, can you tell us a little bit about those? <laughs> yeah, so I I go kind of like go in waves with reading and I don't know, like I, if, if a book really doesn't catch my attention, I have a really hard time reading it. Um, one of the books kind of, kind of related to athletic training, sports medicine, The Arm, mm-hmm. um, about baseball pitchers and kind of the million dollar industry of Tommy John surgery and, and the history behind that was really fascinating to me. Um, uh, League of Denial. That's about football and concussions and all that stuff. Um, and I just actually bought two books yesterday. I went to Barnes and Noble. They're having a really great sale. Okay. And um, one of them is called Brain on Fire, which I think was made into a movie. Um, it's about this girl who basically loses her mind, and they can't figure out why what's going on until like this crazy random diagnosis that finally helped her. Um, and then. Uh, confessions of a surgeon mm. which is i'm pretty i'm pretty excited about um but that then sounds con- like it could be a romance novel confessions of a surgeon <laughs> oh boy. i hope oh it's boy. Not, not what i'm ready for <laughs> <laughs> um and then like 
I also love psychological thrillers. Okay. Like, I can't read it when I go to bed. I can't watch TV shows like that when I go to bed. I'll be up all night and just won't sleep. Um, but Behind Closed Doors is really good. It's, like, really creepy. Mm. Um, but on top of that, like, I think I, I put um, – I'm also huge into podcasts. So my commute is sometimes about an hour, 45 minutes to an hour long. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I have been podcasting up a storm and I have gone through series so quick. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have, I went through dirty John really quick. Oh my dirty God. That's, that's crazy. Okay. Um, Dr. Death. Have either of you heard of that one? Mm-mm. Oh my God. It's about this, this guy who basically, he, uh, is pretend like he's board certified, but like, he's not, he's a neurosurgeon and he's botching surgeries and basically, like shouldn't be practicing medicine but continues to practice medicine and continues to kill people because he has no idea what's going on oh my and gosh. how the like a couple other doctors actually reported him and and it's it's pretty good um and then <clears throat> broken hearts okay. it's about a family who these two um, women adopt six children so three sets of siblings and basically um drives them off a cliff and kills them all and looking oh into um kind of there while it looked really great on social media like the kids were starving they Mm -hmm. like there was a lot of abuse going on but that was a really good one too um i'm trying to see what else i have on my phone um (laughs) i just started the four things podcast with amy brown that's pretty good it's kind of like a feel good um see what else i got on here oh uh what is it what was it called um gladiator that's about aaron Aaron hernandez and his life that was pretty good um let's see oh the 30 for 30s are good um (laughs) this is what i do on my drive um and then and then believed that is um like the larry nasser story oh wow okay and so yeah i've i've gone i just like i would come home for some of them and just like put my headphones in and go upstairs and like just keep listening but um i really love love all those they're pretty good oh that's so, awesome yeah, yeah so we'll definitely we'll definitely make sure we put those in the show notes for for anybody that's interested in yeah, uh, updating so their good. podcasts or books that's perfect yeah. yeah cool okay i love that um but yeah we're getting we're, we're getting kind of close here to the end um and there is one question that we always ask all of our guests on the show sure. right um so you know we here in the movement docs we believe in always moving forward in all that you do so based on all of your previous experience in knowledge and life and love pursuit of happiness what is one piece of advice that you'd give to anyone listening to this show to help them be the best versions of themselves uh, you know it's okay i think the biggest the biggest takeaway is kind of, I think we've already talked about, it's okay to not know something and it's okay to say, I don't know. And it's okay to ask for help. And I think it's, there's no shame in that. And knowing when something is out of your scope of practice or out of your confidence level is, is okay. And it's, it's something that it just means that you're continuing to learn because if if you don't ask for help, you, you already know it. And, and this is a profession that you're always having to learn and things are changing. And and if you're not open to that and then what are you doing? <laughs> I think you, I think, I think asking for that help and knowing when to is super important. And it's like I tell, um, I'm a preceptor at George Mason and I, I tell my student that like, look, it's okay to not get to that, to that diagnosis, to that, to that, what you think is going on. And, and I mean, I struggled in, in grad school too, because you always had to get to a diagnosis and, that's not always how it is in real life and it's it's okay to think you have an idea of what's going on and then the kid comes back the next day and it's completely different and it's okay to not be right all the time (laughs) and to know that just because you failed didn't mean that you actually failed it just means that something didn't work correctly (laughs) Mm -hmm. oh man that resonates so hard (laughs) (laughs) yeah it took me a really long time to just say okay well this is it's okay you don't know (laughs) Mm Yeah, well, it's, it's so true because it's like when you when you're studying and you're kind of in the kind of like the academic world, it's like, OK, well, I'm going to do these tests in this order. I'm going to do this thing. Uh, I'm going to get to the answer and that's how I'm going to treat them and it'll be good. 
yep. right? But rarely does that ever happen. Rarely does anyone ever present the way that, <laughs> you know, that the textbook says they should. Yep. Um, you know, <laughs> and rarely do you have a definitive, yep, this is 100% what's going on. So yep. it's uh, and that's being really, able to... And that's really only happened once in my whole career. <laughs> Well, I guess you can count concussions, but like one definitive, like positive Lachlan's. Well, I know what's wrong with you. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the truth. That's that, uh, that kind of reminds me of, so I picked up this book on Audible <clears throat> and I think it's called, what is it? It's called like Power or something like that. But the premise is that this guy um, went to Davos, Switzerland, and there's this like, really big international like business conference mm -hmm. that has like the biggest names in business, like the most you know powerful and influential people. And he went and interviewed them and like asked them a question. So very similar to kind of like a Tim Ferriss, like tribe of mentors type thing, mm -hmm. but he would ask them specific things about, you know, their situations in business and like, you know, whatever it was. And there was this one CEO who had, it was a female who had taken over this massive merger between two companies and she had said something about like, or had made a decision and some of her like, um, like advisors or whoever were like, you know, very upset. They're like, you know, no, this is, this is wrong. Like you can't do that. You need to do it this way. And she's like, no, this is my decision. This is what we need to do. And later on she realized that it was, a mistake and that she had she had messed up and that there were some consequences that mm -hmm. um, that happened because of that decision and she called this guy into into her office and apologized to him and she was like look i messed up i'm sorry uh i didn't know that this this was going to happen mm -hmm. and i just want you to know that i'm going to do everything i can to make sure that this doesn't happen again because i i didn't know and i made a mistake yeah and the guy left and I think later that night, she got this like crazy long email from him about how no one had ever said that to him before and that everyone else who's ever been a CEO has always just assumed power and has never admitted that they were wrong. And mm -hmm. that he, that she had won his like lifelong loyalty because of oh, that one thing. Wow. that she admitted that she was, she was wrong or she didn't know. And she was willing to, you know, be open about that and grow from that experience. And I think I, I, I remember a conversation real quick, then we can be done. Mm. No, 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 please. <laughs> I remembered a conversation once with, with actually a parent and I had said, um, look, I'm still new at this and I'm still learning. Um, but this is what I think is going on. And she basically, after the conversation, I saw her in person and she was like, the fact that you had said that you're still learning and that this is new, but this is what you think is going on. She goes, nobody does that anymore. The fact that you can, you can say, let's work through this together and, and, and not being so kind of knowing it all. Um, I mean, that's huge. And I think it, that has really helped me kind of, I mean, it brings you back down to earth a little bit and it's okay. People, even though parents can be super intimidating, if you are honest with them and, and, and say those things and, and they, they want the same thing that you want and, and they're just, they're happy that you're there to help their kids. And, um, yeah, so it was just kind of similar. Like it's it it takes it takes a big person to admit wrong and to admit that they're still learning. So, and to kind of go off of that that point, I mean, this rehab, like athletic injuries, like emergency medical care. I mean, there's certainly situations where there is like a black and white, you know, like a life threatening condition. Yep. We have to do X Y Z. But the vast majority of stuff is in such a gray area mm -hmm. that, like, <clears throat> the reality is like. We don't really know. No. You know? <laughs> we don't. We, we, it's human nature to see, you know, two things and to see an association and just to naturally link like, okay, well, because this special test was correct, you clearly have this diagnosis. Yeah. Right? But the reality is like, we don't know. And, you know? and I've learned my favorite saying, especially with kids that come in and say, I think I broke something. Well, what I have done shows that this could, you, you could be right. But again, I don't have x-ray vision. Mm. And I think like when when they hear that, they're like, oh yeah, well, that makes sense. Um, it's it's just it's a it's a lot of I don't know and it's a lot of gray area and and I think that's what again is so frustrating but also so great about it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sometimes I wish that it was not so gray and just it was black and white and this is the way it was gonna be. Mm -hmm. um, 
but that's not how it works. <laughs> nope. 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 That's the truth. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> but it's just so crazy because it permeates to like literally everything that we do, every palpation, every orthopedic <laughs> test. Like, do we, am I actually touching your psoas? Because there's like 15 different <laughs> organs between your skin, my fingers, and wherever the hell that I'm touching. I know I'm in the right area, but. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we don't, we don't really know. Same thing with like muscles. Like, I think this is my biceps, but like. Every, but there's, some an, there's some anatomical variations like what if i'm on your corgo brachialis like i don't know i'm just knocks exactly mm. <laughs> the only muscle that trilaterally extends <laughs> uh, but it, it's just one of the you know it's like the reality of it is if you can frame it as this is a working hypothesis this is my best guess i don't know 100 mm. percent, but let's try and go down this route and then mm. if we need to change directions we can but yeah. like you know I think it, when you can frame it like that and just be honest and admit that sometimes you you really don't know. Um, and it, it's okay to, to spin that into a positive. Like just because you don't know doesn't mean it's a negative thing. Mm. And I think if you make sure that you stay, you stay positive and say like, well, let's try this first. This is what I think it could be, but there are also all these different variations. Let's try this. And if this doesn't help, then let's try something else. Mm -hmm. um, it is, it's, yeah, trying to, it, it, yeah, yeah. Mm. <laughs> oh no, I, I totally agree. And when you talk about framing it to um, in a positive way, you can say, um, you know, also like this is what we can do for you today. You know, we may not have all the answers right now, but like you said, let's try this. This is what we can give, or this is yeah. what we can do, um, and then kind of go that way. Mm -hmm. I, I think especially with in, in an AT setting, right? Like acute injuries. Sometimes people are just so painful. It's like, well, I don't know. I mean, it could be a sprain. Maybe it's a break. Like, but yeah. if you just reassure them educate them say like hey these are things if you see these yeah. signs like you know go to the emergency room or get some treatment mm -hmm. but otherwise just try and relax right you're coming yeah. down off a crazy like adrenaline high yeah and your body's trying to figure some stuff out right now you're not in a, any condition that you're gonna die you're gonna <laughs> live but yeah. just try and see what happens like overnight or the next couple of days yeah. and then if anything bad happens like you know take these steps yeah and and especially the high school setting is always fun because kids are still learning about their bodies and about how they feel. And I've, I've, I've <laughs> I, I have figured out kind of this, this way of not necessarily making light of what's going on, but giving them a pain scale. And if, if they say my, my pain scale is zero, meaning no pain, 10, meaning your leg is being chewed off by a bear. We're going to the hospital right now. Where are you? And sometimes when you kind of dramatize it that much, and they're like, oh, okay, well, because if they're like, well, it's like a nine. Really? That, that, that bad? And then you kind of bring it down a little bit and say, okay, well, I, so you're uncomfortable, but it's not excruciating. Like if, if you can kind of make it so, kind of try to relax them in a sense of this is not life-threatening. I get that it hurts. I do. But let's kind of bring it down a little bit because this could be a lot worse. Um, they, always, they always love that. They like laugh a little bit. How do you know I don't. I'm just guessing. <laughs> the scrubs pain scale. <laughs> I don't yeah. think I've seen that. That's so okay. Funny. We're we're gonna Love send that to you. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> That's phenomenal. Oh, oh my gosh. So well, fun. <laughs> Ashley, we can't take, oh, wow, my gosh, we can't thank you enough for uh, <laughs> taking the time to be on our show today. Um, if anybody listening to the show wants to get in contact with you, what's the best way that they can do that? Um, email is fine. Um, I can give it to you. Um, it's Ashley period Schuster 13 at gmail.com. Perfect. Um, okay. Yeah, I'm pretty good at answering emails. Awesome. So we'll, uh, we'll put that in the show notes for anybody that wants to get in contact with Ashley and ask yeah. some questions about uh, anything from life, life and love, pursuit of happiness to yeah. athletic training to grad school all yeah. that fun stuff all, all the things <laughs> all the things well perfect well thanks again for tuning in this week where we spoke with ashley schuster msatc lat if you have any questions comments concerns or have a topic that you'd like us to discuss shoot us an email at tmdmovementdocs at gmail.com thanks and we'll see you next week holy crap that's what i gotta pay for dues <laughs> <laughs>